Hey everyone, before we get started, I just want to mention that this is a dark video. All these stories are pretty dark and disturbing, and several of them mention murder. If you don't want to hear stories like that, you should click off right now. Also, just about every story is backed up with proof via news articles that I'll have in the description. You can check those out there. All that being said, let's go ahead and get started. And remember to always stay hungry. This happened in November 2019 when my family and I went to London over Thanksgiving break. We were walking across London Bridge and had stopped to take pictures along the way. It was freezing cold though, so we didn't take too many before hurrying to the other side. When we got to the other end of the bridge, we had heard screams from behind us and people were running across the bridge right in our direction. We left the area quickly but didn't really think anything else of it. That is, until we found out what happened on the news just a couple of hours later. It turned out a convict who had recently been released had stabbed people in a building on the other side of the bridge and then ran out under the bridge. People were restraining him, and someone even used a narwhal tusk to defend themselves after the attack. Two of the people he stabbed unfortunately died of their injuries. That night, all of the bridges across the River Thames were shut down to cars, and even though it was late at night, when we were heading back to our hotel, we couldn't take a taxi, and we had to walk. I'll have a link in the description for proof. I'm a mid-30s female, and I moved into my current apartment building back in 2017, right before I turned 30. Originally, I had moved in with a female friend, and we had one major creepy thing happen our first month living there. But that's a story for another time. The story takes place in March 2019. The building is in a busy entertainment district of Mississauga, Ontario, about 30 minutes away from Toronto. It's a lot of bars, restaurants, and shops that draw visitors and locals. So you can imagine that we hear a lot of yelling, drunken scuffles, and occasionally police are in the area. In my building specifically, we've heard fights through the walls. Unhoused folks camp out in the small glass entryway before the locked tenant key fob. And in general, it can be a little rowdy, especially in the summer. However, what happened one night on a floor below us was something that no one expected. At about 10.30 p.m. on a Friday night, a couple in their late 40s and mid 50s were having some kind of a fight. Now, this is too many floors away for me to hear personally, but the Facebook group for our building had neighbors make some posts about it. It turns out that the woman in her late 40s was suffering from an unknown mental illness which she had been struggling with for a long time. Her partner was apparently a Freemason. This was found out when I told this story to coworkers and my boss knew him from another chapter. He was a kind, gentle man, and his partner would be sweet and loving for most of the time. But either due to mental illness or other mental troubles, switched to being verbally and physically abusive. This particular night, something terrible happened, and she stabbed her partner to death. He was found in the bathroom and didn't live to leave the apartment. It's unknown who called 911. But the police were called and within a couple of hours there were cops, ambulances, and crime scene technicians all over the building. I don't believe I ever ran into either person, but it was such a surreal experience to know that something like this happened in our building. Some reports have the wrong address, but there are photos of my building and the hallways are the same. I wish Michael peace wherever he is, and that Mary gets the help she needs, but also does get the punishment she deserves. Mental illness is not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Once again, I'll have articles in the description. I only have partial proof due to the nature of one of the incidents. I wasn't part of the story, but it was told to us by a cop friend. Both of these incidents happened in 2012. Here's the first story. My now husband and I worked at a gas station right off the interstate on I-75. He was friends with all the cops that came in during night shift, 
while I worked second shift. He got all the crazy tales since it was not as busy as during third shift. I'm going to be sending the wiki article to show the partial proof of what occurred. Look for the year 2012 by hitting control F. I will not be naming the city my husband's name or the cop's name. So let's just call the cop Jeff and my husband's name Oren. Jeff came in one night while Oren was working and the gas station was empty. Oren rang up Jeff's free coffee and Jeff has a story to tell him. Now again, I'm telling from third hand knowledge, but here's the gist. Jeff explains that he's had a very rough week along with the next county sheriff's office. There was a well-known landslide one county over that was causing serious delays in traffic along with people sitting in their cars for hours on end. Southbound was closed because of this. Jeff goes on to tell Oren about a particular incident that left his blood running cold, which isn't too difficult for Oren as nothing gets under his skin. Jeff explains that someone approached him when he was trying to direct traffic very carefully to get some of the blockage to go down. This man informs Jeff that he's with one of the morgues and that he really needs to get through sooner than later. Jeff explains that he'll need to wait in line like everyone else. The man then looks at him solemnly and then explains the following statement. Sir, I really need to get through as soon as possible. I have a deceased victim in my vehicle and their storage container is beginning to melt. Of course, I'm not 100% on the verbiage from the morgue man, but you get my gist. The cop then said that he makes arrangements to get the hearse through as quickly as possible in front of the other vehicles. Jeff then said that he had never had such a bizarre and surreal moment in his whole career. Now take this story with a grain of salt, as this of course would not be shared to media outlets due to the nature of the story. However, the reason behind it I can say at least is there's some proof due to the landslide. Now on to my second story. I have been trying to find this one for over a year to send you, and I can't find anywhere where this was covered. Now, my husband Oren and let's call myself Ann were driving home from our call center job. We lived almost an hour away from our workplace, and we were planning to move closer to it soon, but the drive was long. We also worked until 1 a.m. ET, so of course it was dark. We were driving down I-75 that night when we saw something up ahead that had caught us off guard. There is a tractor trailer in the median between north and southbound. If you want to try and find it where I've not been able to, it was between Lake City, Tennessee and Kayville, Tennessee on I-75 where this occurred. We proceed to turn down our music, turn on our flashers, and pull over to the emergency lane on the other side of the road. That's when we noticed a truck rammed into the east side of the wall going north. Oren told me to call 911 and gets out of the vehicle, then runs over to the pickup truck that's crunched into the wall and just stands there staring. I was telling the 911 operator what I knew at the time and the location letting her know that I don't know the details of the occupants and that my fiance was checking on them now. I get off the phone with dispatch and Oren comes back over to me breathing heavily. He tells me that he had just seen one of the worst things he's ever seen. I asked him repeatedly what and he says he needs to go check on the truck driver. Now keep in mind, it's only us stopped and everyone else is flying by. Oren gets a face full of glass as someone speeds by as he then proceeds to cuss them out, then sprint into the median to check on the driver. He helped the truck driver out who had to climb from the driver's seat and out of the passenger window as it was turned over on its side. The truck driver is okay and had some minor scratches and whiplash. After more people began stopping and assessing the situation, we left. I asked several times what had happened to the pickup truck. He said that he could see the driver of the vehicle along with three other passengers were dead. He said there was another, but he wasn't sure if they were still alive. He was too afraid to approach them. I asked why. Of course, because who wouldn't want to help someone that was just in a crash? He said that he just couldn't. I then persisted, and he then snapped at me. Because they're all dead. Their fucking skulls were imploded, and their brains and blood were everywhere. She was just sitting there, still with her eyes wide open. 
The person beside her was lying on her shoulder with glass all through their face and clearly dead. I just couldn't. It really took us a while to recover from this, especially him since he saw what he saw. All I know left from the story is what we heard from our cop buddies. The pickup truck driver was drunk driving with him and his friends. The semi driver tried to swerve out of the way of the pickup and it was going left to the right lane dangerously fast, which ended up turning him over into the median. The pickup slammed into the wall on the right side of the northbound interstate. Yeah, a pickup truck held four people in the front seat illegally. The other three were pronounced dead on impact while the woman was taken by Lifestar, but he couldn't share any more details. I don't know if this woman is still alive, but I hope she's in a better place whether it be mentally or physically. I can't imagine what she went through. All I can say from this is, guys, just don't drink and drive. You can take not only your own life, but others. It's just not worth it. For context, I work at the local government level in the criminal division with the county I currently reside in. Although I'll be linking some sources below for some proof, I'm going to be keeping my name and exact job title out of it, just so I'm not easily identified by anyone who also works at the courthouse, and more specifically, my office. Anyway, on with the story. In my office, there was this one guy who on the surface seemed fairly normal. While I'd hear the occasional gossip about some of his small mistakes, the only thing about him that I found mildly irritating was the fact that he'd play loud music from his phone at his desk. I'm not really sure how this is appropriate workplace behavior, but I digress. Regardless, he was a consistent guy who put in the effort, stayed highly organized, didn't cause any drama, and he kept a positive attitude. He pretty much stayed in his own lane and zoned in on his tasks at hand each day. One day during the summer, I was getting trained on a new task to fill in for an employee taking an extended leave of absence when I overheard a conversation between two of my coworkers, one of whom was training me. Let's call them A and B. B comes to A's desk with a very serious tone to her voice, which is out of character for her, so I know something's up already. B tells A something along the lines of, Can I speak to you for a minute? You're not in trouble or anything but please come to my desk. You may want to have a seat for this, but Sean no longer works here. He's been fired after being caught stealing money from expungement checks, and I guess someone caught on to it and busted him. I can tell by A's tone of voice from far away that she was shocked, as she had never seen any red flags in the guy at the time he had been working there. But of course, it doesn't quite end there. I ended up hearing the words murder charge in their conversation, but I was too far away to catch on to what they were actually talking about. I assumed they had changed the subject of the conversation to a criminal case B had been dealing with. She was prone to be a gossip, and she liked discussing the absurdities of different cases with her buddies at work. But when A came back to finish training me, I found out that wasn't the truth. When A came back, she looked completely floored. She told me everything. Years ago, Sean was charged with two counts of homicide back in the late 90s. He was supposed to be on death row before he filed an appeal in 2013, leading to his case being re-examined. Ultimately, he was released right before the pandemic started. Keep in mind, he wasn't exonerated. He committed the crime and was charged, but had the death sentence completely wiped and was released from prison. If you read the articles provided, you may come to the conclusion that what he was doing was in the defense of his girlfriend, who had been robbed by the two that were shot and killed by Sean and his accomplice. But the way that he attempted to dispose of the remains by putting the bodies in a van and setting it ablaze is just chilling. Thinking of the times that I had the opportunity to work with Sean and seeing him passing in the office, which was every day, it makes me think even harder about the fact that no matter how long you've known someone, their backstory may always remain a mystery. I'm not sure what will happen with him, but this has done nothing but strengthen my own workplace values. Your coworkers are never truly your friends. Although this incident never directly caused me any harm, again, 
I still think about what people's pasts are filled with and how they do such a great job at covering them up. Despite Sean's past with, well, homicide and now stealing money off checks, I still hope he can find some inner peace and healing. I'm not quite sure where he is now, but I'm assuming he's facing some theft charges. This all took place back in August, and his position has still not been filled. Unfortunately, this has placed a heavier burden on some of my colleagues to make up for the missed work, considering how specific and highly critical his job was. It's really sad how someone was able to secure this job for him to get him back on the right track, just to ruin any of his chances of any stable employment in the future. I've linked a few sites below where you can see for yourself. My name is Summer. At the time of this story, I believe I was 20 years old, and this happened back in September of 2021. It was the weekend, and I normally would go out to random house parties. This weekend, I had went with two of my girlies who we'll call Sarah and Emily. I also invited about three other boys I knew, and we took three cars, I being one of the drivers with my two girlies. Emily had already met at my place to carpool, and I went to pick up Sarah at her place while the boys followed me. We started the night at this party I had never been to before. We parked in this small parking lot across the street from the building where the party was at. After all my friends got out of the car, we walked across the street and had seen people heading in. There was a 15-year-old boy outside with an AR. Now, I know most people would think, fuck no, and then turn around. But I don't know. Where I live, everybody has guns. They all think they're tough shit. So to me, it was just another kid that wanted to look tough and probably have the job as the bouncer. So we continued on into the house. We walked up these very dark and narrow stairs that opened up into a small one-bedroom apartment. The music was loud, and there was a lot of people. We were pretty much the only white people there. I didn't have a problem with that, but the problem was that no one was dancing. The atmosphere was giving me a really weird vibe, so it felt like all eyes were on us, but I just ignore it thinking I'm just overthinking. My friend Sarah is a really big successful plug, so she said she was going to sit down and roll us a blunt. As I waited, one of my friends that I haven't seen in a long time happened to be at the party as well, and he had whispered in my ear, Hey, you see that guy behind us? He's got a knife. Having a knife was a red flag, but what really got my attention was the fact that this guy was wearing a black ski mask. I understand that it's COVID season, but the vibe this man had was just not good. He wasn't even talking to anyone. He was just scanning the room looking for someone. I then hurried over to my friends, Sarah and Emily. I had told Sarah, come on, let's go. You can light the blunt outside. But her being drunk couldn't grasp the fear in my tone and just kept asking, why? Why do we gotta go? I just told her, I'll tell you outside, come on. So we made our way outside back to my car in the parking lot. All of the boys were out there too. I told everyone what I saw, and only the boys seemed suspicious. The girls seemed to act like I was crazy and I was just reading into it. So I then just told them, here, let's make some mixed drinks. I opened my trunk, and I wrapped the empty bottles I had with pineapple juice, and we made drinks. I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty proud of myself for coming in clutch. We had just finished making everyone a drink, and as we're talking, I heard it. It sounded like a firework. I looked around me in the sky, but I saw no lights. Then I hear it again. I still see no lights, and I realize that that's not fireworks. Those are gunshots, and now a storm of people are running out towards the parking lot. I dug down behind my car next to the riverside door, and I'm waiting for my friend Emily to unlock the car from her side because my key fob only unlocks from the side the key's on. As I'm nailed down waiting, people are screaming all around me. I looked in front of me, and I had seen the ski mask dude running in the street shooting back. I couldn't believe it. These motherfuckers were having a literal cowboy shootout out in the street. 
A girl runs out in front of my car and lets out a loud shriek and then drops to the floor. I couldn't see her after she dropped, but I assumed she just got up and started running again. I thought that maybe she only shrieked because the bullet just grazed her and she got scared. Like what are the real chances a girl gets shot right beside me of all people? I was such a naive dumb blonde back then. Continuing on, we were all finally in my car. That's when I then slammed it into reverse and bolted for the street, following my friend's car. As we were driving, people were following behind us, and they're even passing my car. Everyone else was getting the hell out of there. From a distance, I could hear sirens. I had parked my car after driving away, and I'm checking my whole body, wondering if adrenaline and shock were masking a bullet hole for me. I frantically touched everywhere, but I was okay. I was safe, and so were my friends. I felt so bad that these people I invited out with me don't usually go to parties with me. And of course, the one time they finally come out, they witness a shooting. After apologizing to the girls and calming down, we had called the boys and they were all fine as well. I didn't want this night to go to waste, so I had mentioned that I knew of another party that I'd been to the weekend before. It was a notorious party house by some Notre Dame girls. Just the weekend before when I intended, it was a completely normal party with no danger. So I figured it would be fine to go to this one. The problem was is that it was like 1am and normally this house is known for starting the party just after the bars had closed in the area. So I had suggested that we just park in the parking lot across from the party house and then do our thing till the people showed up. They all agreed and we were having our fun time waiting. The parking lot started to fill up with more people waiting as well. The girls had finally arrived at about 2 a.m. and had opened the doors to everyone. The house was in a neighborhood with houses all close together, but inside the house was a completely bare decor. Now, these girls only used this house as a means to party, study, and sleep. They had a couch and a TV, but nothing else. There wasn't even carpet on the floors, just wood planks. There was also no food in the fridge. I mean, literally nothing. The house had started to fill up super fast, so my friends and I went out into the backyard. The backyard was decorated much nicer than the rest of the house. They shared the backyard with other houses as well. They had a string of Christmas lights outside, a wooden beer pong table, and even a futon. The music was booming, but the vibe and the people were a lot better than the previous party. My girls were busy getting drunk, and I had walked around to see if I recognized anyone. Emily was the most drunk out of all of us. She's quite the social bug. I asked her to walk around and see if she could figure out who had ox here, and Sarah and I smoked a blunt on the futon. A random girl who was drunk started to pick fights with this black guy, and he was very much telling her off, telling her to shut her fucking mouth, that she's playing with the wrong motherfucker, and things like that. Her friend had seen what was going down, and apologized for her friend. They then walked over to the pong table and did their own thing. More people started to fill up the backyard, and after a while, I decided to search for Emily and make sure she was okay. I had found her talking to a group of guys, and one of the guys in the mix was Montel O'Neill. Emily had a boyfriend, and unfortunately, whenever she gets drunk, she tends to be overly flirtatious. I noticed that everyone on the porch was singing and waving a big ass street sign that said private property, like they were taunting the police car nearby. I told Emily that Sarah had finished rolling a blunt and to come with before it's gone. We walked away and we never talked to those guys again, but after smoking the blunt on the futon, I heard it again. Two more fireworks from inside the house. I knew that it wasn't fireworks. Hell no, not after that last party. I ran so fast to the gate door, leaving all my friends behind. I assume if you heard gunshots, you'd be running too. But they were all so drunk that they didn't grasp the reality fast enough. I was the first one there at the gate, and I had seen a storm of people running towards me, but the pressure was cracking down on me. The gate had a lock on it, and it wasn't a normal lock. The pressure was so intense I didn't want to be the one to fumble with the lock, 
so I had to let the man that was running just a couple of feet behind me do it instead. He managed to get the lock open, and I let him run first out the gate. I then sprinted towards the parking lot where my car was, and let me tell you, you know that scene from Forrest Gump where the mechanics around his legs break off as he's running? That's exactly how I felt. I was running at the speed of light. I've never moved so fast in my life. I make it to my car and kneel down again, looking around for all my friends. I see Sarah coming towards me, and she's not a very fast runner. I blame the alcohol, to be honest. But we were searching for Emily. That's when I finally see her running up, and I then frantically asked her, Give me my key. I need my key to open the door. You see, I didn't have any pockets, and Emily had a backpack with my key inside it. Her face goes pale while she's gasping for air. I don't have it. I don't know where my backpack is. I was so pissed and scared. The cops would be coming soon and I don't have my key. You gotta be fucking kidding me. I looked at her and I told her to go get it. As shitty as this was, I was terrified. I had already barely survived one shooting and I didn't know how much luck I'd had left. Emily ran back to the house only to come back still with no backpack. She said that they locked the gate again and that she couldn't get in to find the backpack. Selfishly, I told her, Okay, come on. We ran back to the gate and I gave her my phone. I then told her, Wait right here. I'll be right back. I jumped on the garbage can and then hopped over the fence. No one was in the yard, but I can see the backpack on the futon. I then ran and grabbed the bag. When I started running to the gate, I could hear from inside the house. Please wake up. Please don't fall asleep. Please wake up. There were girls crying in there, screaming for the man Montello O'Neill to wake up. As I made it to the gate door, a tall skinny black man comes out of the house and then says, Baby girl, we gotta go. To which I just replied back with, I'm sorry, I just needed to get my bag. We ran out together. And of course, my friend is nowhere in sight. How stupid of me to think my drunkest friend would still be in the spot that I left her at. I don't even have my phone to call her because she was holding on to it for me. I ran straight back into the parking lot, but when I locked the front door, I had then seen cops charging inside the house. I got in my car and slammed on the pedal and parked up against the street, and I made it look like my car was just one of the neighbor's cars. I had told Sarah everything. She was older than me, so I thought she'd be wiser than me. And I then asked her, What do I do, Sarah? What do I do? All she could tell me was she didn't know. I don't really know what I expected her to say. She definitely wasn't sober. All she could talk about was when I ran away, she had no idea where to go, and she went toward the backyard, but that it was just a dead end and she had to make her way through the crowd. I felt really bad for leaving her, I didn't mean to, but my body just acted in flight mode. I'm still searching desperately for Emily in the parking lot, just waiting to see if I could find her. And I did. Tall, white, skinny girl, big boobs flying out of her crop top, running frantically to the last car in the parking lot. Luckily, she got to the car, and she had begged random teenage boys to let her in and take her home. She thought that I had left her since the car wasn't in the parking lot. I had never been more proud of my very drunk friend, Emily. She was smart enough to remember my basic phone passcode, and she then called my friend Sarah's phone. She said that she had left the spot that I left her at because cops were on their way through the door, and she got scared and ran. But when she ran, she had dropped her phone. I then picked her up, and we went home after that. But the next weekend, I had spoke to the police, and I gave them my story. From what I found out, they actually found Emily's phone at the crime scene, and they gave her her phone back. Do you remember the man I told you about that was arguing with the aggressive drunk girl? He was the same man that shot Montel O'Neill. A couple of months later, I had met a guy who happened to go to the same party, and he said he actually talked to the guy that murdered Montel O'Neill. The guy even texted him asking if he made it out okay. It took a while, but they did find out who killed him. Montel O'Neill was also an identical twin. No one really knows the motive behind the murder. But from what I heard, 
Montel O'Neill was at a party one weekend and got into a fight with someone, and the murder was payback. The four women that owned the notorious party house were kicked out of Notre Dame, and I'm not even sure if they got any charges. There's a link in the description to the article about this story if you want to check it out. Hey everyone, that's about it for today's stories. If you have your own story that you would like to send, you can send it in at southerncannibal.com or you can email it at southerncannibalstories at gmail.com. I look forward to telling your story. Have a good night or good day, everyone. And remember to always stay.